All right, welcome to week six, video 15. I'm calling this one uh, the semantic view of theories and how to use it. Um, and it's gonna give you some more concepts for analyzing a scientific event that will hopefully help you understand uh, some of the findings that Gere or that Desmond uses in his, um, in his book. And actually, uh, I started to say Gire there because most of what I'm doing here is based on this book here uh, by Ron Gire. And actually, he's got several co-authors for the fifth edition, which was the last one he produced. Uh, he passed away now. But uh, uh, this is a textbook that is useful for, well, here. Being a better consumer of scientific information, right? Um, in the modern world, all of our decision making in some ways has to be science based. Uh, and the world is full of people who will tell you you're wrong because science. And they'll just try and throw science at you as a reason to do what they want or not want. But science is a part of decision making, but it's only a part because we always have to make decisions based on our values in, in addition to science. And science can never, science can only tell us about what is. Um, it can't tell us about what should be. Um, I've emphasized in the past the difference between normative and descriptive statements, right? Um, descriptive statements are about the way the world is. And normative statements are the statements uh, are statements like we find in ethics about the way the world should be. And before you can talk about the way the world should be, you need to know how the world is. And so we need to have a, a basis in science for everything that we do. But um, the science is never going to be definitive because we also have values. All right. So Ron Gary's book is focused on. Uh, scientific events, right? He's, he's, he's looking at science as a process, um, and it's a process that, among other things, generates models of the world. And he opens his book. Sometimes I uh, assign chapters of it, but in, um, uh, it's often too, too much detail to go into in, for instance, an ethics course. So I'm just giving you my little summary here. Um, he starts out with a description of a relatively famous, a very famous scientific event, the discovery of the structure of DNA. DNA has become uh, such an icon for, um, well, s science and the idea of inheritance and biology. And it, 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 it has, uh, the image of the double helix is a powerful m metaphor well, let's talk about how we got there. We got there because of an event, a discovery in science. Um, and so Gire tells this story at the beginning of his textbook because it illustrates several important features of science. And so I'm going to tell my version of the story and what I think you should get out of it. Um, so the characters. Um, Rosalind Franklin is, uh, was a x-ray, she was an experimentalist. Um, she worked with taking x-ray pictures of DNA in what's called its A and B forms. She was working at a lab run by a man named Maurice Wilkins. Um, two super junior scientists um, went, uh, uh, went to work at that lab, James Watson and Francis Crick. Watson had just gotten his PhD. Crick was actually an older guy, but he was still working on his PhD. Um, so these are the four main characters. What was known? At the time, people knew that there was some chemical that was passed on through, the, uh, through your cells that determined what you would inherit biologically. Um, and they knew that this was either going to be the DNA or the proteins. They knew that the DNA was made up of chains of sugars, phosphates, and bases. 
and that it had two, three, or four chains in it. So there's a picture of the young Watson and Crick looking at um, a physical model of DNA, and that's going to be important for what we talk about. Watson and Crick meet at Cavendish Lab. There, Rosalind Franklin is already using X-ray crystallography, um, a fancy X-ray technique, to study the structure of DNA. Um, Franklin wasn't releasing her data yet because she felt it wasn't ready. She was a perfectionist, um, and she was an experimentalist. She was very hands-on. She wanted these things to be right. Um, the lab boss, Maurice Wilkins, let Watson and Crick look at um, Franklin's data in order to piss her off. Um, he disliked her, um, and uh, misogyny plays a big role here. Um, Franklin got a lot of opposition from men in science for being a woman in science. So to piss her off, uh, Maurice Wilkins lets Watson and Crick look at a picture. This is the picture, photograph 51. Um, and this provides uh, a crucial piece of evidence to Watson and Crick. Um, there are a couple other things that they learn. Um, they, they learn from word of mouth that a crucial piece of information in a standard textbook is wrong. So they're actually using a standard textbook to uh, do their work, and it's got a false piece of information in it. Um, a third thing, a, a discovery by an outside par person named Chargoff. He discovers that um, two, uh, two pairs of molecules always occur in equal amounts. And this was enough. So these three things, the picture that was stolen, the, um, uh, the knowledge, the information that a standard piece of information in a textbook is wrong, and this additional discovery about the quantities of these chemicals was enough for Watson and Crick to solve the mystery. So they start building cardboard models. Um, they actually just, they're, they're building physical models. It's like they're playing, it's like they're playing with Legos. Um, but uh, when they, they build these models, what they do has to correspond properly to reality. Um, so they start with a, a version that has three chains, um, and Franklin shoots that down because it won't contain enough water. So they build a model, but um, the model doesn't make the right predictions. Um, and so then they build the two-chain model. It makes the right prediction about the water. It makes the right prediction about the uh, equal quantities of these, these um, four molecules. And it predicts the x-ray picture that um, Franklin had produced. So Watson and Crick build the two-chain model. Watson and Franklin, Wilkins and Franklin, the other two people in the lab, agree that it works. Watson and Crick publish it in the, in the journal Nature which is the most prestigious journal in science, uh, or one of two, next to also science. Uh, the two prestigious journals are science and nature. Um, so what happens after that? Watson, Crick, and Wilkins win the Nobel Prize. Wilkins wins it simply because he ran the lab where the work took place. Watson and Crick won it because they built the model. Franklin does not win anything. She is disqualified from the um, prize because she passes away before it's awarded. Um, also, her name in general and her contribution to this uh, effort is uh, sort of washed over in history. And actually, I want to point out that there are two factors at work here. One is sexism. Another is a, another hierarchy that exists in science that people don't think about much outside of science, which is that um, theoreticians, model builders like Watson and Crick, tend to have more prestige than experimentalists like Franklin. Um, 
this even though, you know, nothing get, nothing gets done unless Franklin's producing the data. Um, shortly after um, uh, the Nobel Prize, Watson writes the first of many bitchy memoirs um, and in general turns out to be kind of a jerk. All right. So I just, we just spent 10 minutes uh, explaining a story from the history of science. Um, I want to I want to draw four lessons here. Science, this is probably the most important one. Science is the product of the interaction of humans who are petty and short-sighted with the physical world, which is confusing. Science people when they throw science at you, they want it they they act like they're throwing pure objectivity. You can't argue with me, it's science. But what they're throwing at you is not the exact truth. It is an attempt to get at the truth that was developed by human beings with all their with, with all their um, faults. Scientists build models. You know, Watson and Crick built a physical model. Scientific communication goes through many channels. And when I taught a full course on this, I went off on this for a long time. Um, but I'll just do a couple slides on it. Um, and then finally, there's a lot of sexism in science. Four basic lessons from this story. Scientists communicate with each other all sorts of different ways. Directly, through conference publications, online, through um, databases like the Archive, and through official journal articles. This is how scientists communicate with each other. We're all sitting on the outside here, um, and we get information about these conversations, right? And we get them through um, <clears throat> different sources. Uh, but ultimately, uh, the box there marked science journalists is incredibly important. Um, these are reporters who specialize in explaining science. Um, these days, YouTubers who do science communication are also really important. That's where my son gets most of his science information. In any case, the science journalists are reporting things they hear from the scientific methods of communication. And there's also this, I, I think, a really underestimated element in this uh, chain of communication, the university press release, um, which is generally written by, uh, you know, someone with a bachelor's degree who works for the college. They're not, they're, who, who's in, in public relations. But that's a crucial stage for how science gets communicated to the public. Um, and then from the science journalists, things go through various levels of journalism, and then finally to the average citizen. Okay, I want to introduce two technical terms here. Um, that I think will help us understand the limitations of what comes out of this process. Uh, these are the theory latedness of observation and the underdetermination of theory by evidence. The theory latedness of observation just points out that observations can never be made outside of the context of some theory or another. We don't just see the world directly. We always see the world through the lens of our background beliefs. And with science, this can become really um, detailed. Um, uh, uh, so I sh uh, earlier I showed you um, Franklin's x-ray data, that famous photograph. It just looked like a blurry X to you, right? Um, if you don't know what you're looking at, it doesn't have any meaning. To know the meaning of that, for that to count as scientific data, 
you have to already have a whole bunch of theories. Um, a th uh, you have to understand how x-rays work. You have to understand how molecules work. You, um, the data isn't, data isn't pure. Data is always um, laden with theory. Under determination of theory by evidence. In one way or another, you never have enough evidence. Um, you can always find more evidence. You, there will always be unanswered questions. And so in many ways, the uh, decision to call something proven um, involves a judgment call, right? Um, at some point, you have to uh, say, all right, this is going to be enough evidence, even though, um, well, one way of putting it is that given a batch of evidence, you can always come up with multiple possible explanations for it. Um, it's just that some of them are going to be more complicated or more clunky or less likely than others, right? And that, that's when the, that, that, that judgment call comes in. All right. So <clears throat> I draw on something here called the semantic view of theories. I like this um, because I think it's a simple way of understanding what science is. I said in an earlier video that there's actually a lot of argument about what the scientific method is, but everyone agrees that it's some kind of hypothesis confirmation. So this is one way of understanding um, the scientific method. It's one way of understanding what a theory is. You know, in ordinary speech, people often will just say a theory is like a, something like a hunch. And sometimes they'll say, people will say, well, evolution isn't true. It's just a theory. But that's not, that's not the way theory is used in science. Um, and so the semantic view of theories says something very specific. A theory is a collection of models and hypotheses that relate those models to the world. So sometimes those models can be physical models, like the, um, like the, the physical model that Watson and Crick built. Sometimes these are uh, analog models. That is, they are models where one thing is used as an analogy for another. So in medicine all the time, Rats are used as analog models for humans. And there are other standard animal models, Drosophila and um, C. elegans and that sort of thing. And then there are a lot of theoretical models. These are models that are made out of symbols, ultimately, um, sometimes uh, computer programs. The thing about models is that models are like maps. Models represent the world. They, they have a similar structure to the world that they represent, but they simplify the world. Social conventions explain how to link them to the world. A model is not true or false, really. Or if it is, they're all false, because they've all simplified in one way or another. Models fit the world better or worse for different purposes. So what I want to emphasize here is models are maps, and the map is not the territory. Here, let's skip over here. Oops. There's a map of the New York City subway system. There is a picture of the New York City subway system. The map is not the territory. And in fact, in this case, you're actually looking at two representations, right? A picture and a map. Not, none of us right now are looking at the New York City subway system. Um, so it's always important to remember that we are looking at representations and not realities. Uh, Gire, in his textbook, illustrates this with a, with a, with a little game. So um, this is the map of the campus that he used to teach at, at the University of Minnesota. Um, there's a bridge, there are a bunch of buildings. And you, he asks, what is the black arrow pointing to? 
and someone will be able to say, oh, it's pointing to this building. Um, but it's not pointing to the building, it's pointing to a gray rectangle. So a lot comes down to this famous painting here um, that you may have seen this in an art history class or something. It's, there's a pipe and beneath it, it says, ceci n'est pas un pipe, uh, which is, this is not a pipe in French. This is a painting called The Treachery of Images by Magritte. And here he's pointing out simply that um, you're not looking at a pipe, you're looking at a picture of a pipe. All right, so Ron Geary gives us a model for a scientific episode, an event in science. Um, and it's got four basic components. There's the real world, the thing that we're actually trying to learn about. And then there's the model of the real world. And everything I was just telling you before is to remind you that the map is not the territory. The model is not the real world. You use the model to drive some predictions um, and then you make observations or do experiments to see if those predictions come true. That's the hypothesis testing part of it. So we can get a, a, a square diagram like this. Uh, you have the real world and a model of the real world. Um, on the side of the real world, you conduct experiments or make observations and generate data. Data, which is always um, theory laden, but it's data. On the other side, you get some reasoning or calculating to make a prediction based on the model. And hopefully the prediction matches the data. So let's talk about this for the discovery of DNA. What's the real world we're talking about here? You know, animals, their bodies, their proteins, the DNA, the fact that uh, children look like their parents. Um, the model then is the physical model of the DNA and the computations based on it. That model um, was developed by Watson and Crick and they made some predictions. The water will, the DNA will contain a certain amount of water. These uh, two pairs of molecules will always exist in equal ratios. And um, uh, you'll get something that looks like that x-ray picture. Meanwhile, on the experimental side, people like Rosalind Franklin and Chargoff produce data. And it turns out that the data matches. And so you get um, agreement. You get that a model that fits the world in the way that you want. I'm going to do one more here. So here's a claim. We are, we, are, I, we are still talking ultimately about evicted and the claims that Matthew Desmond makes in it. So let's talk about this. Um, between 2000 and 2000, 2009 and 2011, there's a typo on that slide, one in eight Milwaukee renters experienced a forced move. There's a real world and a model. The real world is the people who rent in Milwaukee. And the model is a theoretical representation of what's going on in, in Milwaukee. And one of the things that we'll see Matthew Desmond doing here is that in his model, the definition of eviction is broader than it normally is. Um, it includes any time a landlord forces you out of your apartment or your house, even if they're not taking you to eviction court or serving a formal eviction notice. Matthew Desmond ran a survey called the Milwaukee Area's Renters Study, or MARS, um, and that produces, that, that's a study where real people interact in the physical world and they produce data, 1,086 interviews with, with people. That data agrees with the prediction made by the model. So that's how you get um, this scientific claim here. Okay, so now I wanna go back and look at something I was talking about in the previous video. Um, previous video I talked about quantified categorical statements um, 
And I said that when you have a single quantified categorical statement, you are making what you are giving what is called a distribution model. It's a representation of the world. Um, and it represents how common a trait is in a population. Correlation models were involved two quantified categorical statements. Um, and the relationship between those two quantify, uh, quantified categorical statements, between those two variables, essentially, um, winds up being uh, the correlation. But what we're really interested in in science is what, they, what we call a causal model. We want to know if one thing actually causes another. For instance, whether the presence of children causes eviction. Um, and to do that, you need to add something more to your representation of the world besides these two quantified categorical statements. But we're not going to have time to go into a, a lot of this detail here. Um, instead, I just want to talk a bit more about representing correlations. A correlation is a relationship between two variables or as two quantified categorical statements as representations, right? Um, so we can use these diagrams, and this is something from Geary's textbook that I want you to do for the next exercise, um, to represent a correlation. They're just simple box diagrams. Um, in probability theory and statistics, people love to talk about pulling balls out of jars or urns. And, you know, the balls generally will come in different colors or they might be different sizes, right? So um, you, you can imagine that, that in talking about, in producing a model of this jar full of balls, you have two variables, one for size, the balls can be large or small, and uh, one for color, they can be red or green. So you've got two variables and you've got two differences in percentages. So here you can see that um, of the red balls, 75% are small. And it, it's not marked, but that means that only 25% are large. Whereas of the green balls, 30% are small. So in this population, um, being red correlates with being small. There wouldn't be a correlation if those two percentages were exactly the same, which is what, how they are on the right-hand diagram, right? So um, if 75% of red balls are small and 75% of green balls are small, then just 75% of all the balls are small and it's always the same, there's no correlation. Anytime though you have a difference between those two numbers, you've got a correlation. And that actually tells you that you're, you're a long way from being uh, having a causal relationship here, right? So, a correlation is a relationship between two variables, and it's often represented in statistics with, a, with a ver another variable called R, which is, uh, or it's not a variable, it's a coefficient, the correlation coefficient, or Pearson's R, which is uh, said to go from negative one to one, and it measures the degree to which two variables agree. Um, but what we're going to talk about now is... Uh, these, these bar diagrams, right? And I want you to represent some um, claims from Desmond using bar diagrams. So, like I said, we've got distribution models and correlation models. In the previous exercise, I had you just identify F and G the how did you know that exercise, um, I, F's and G's and Q's for different statements that Desmond makes. Now I want you to identify them as either distributions or correlations. If they are correlations, then you can draw a correlation diagram like this. 
because you're going to have actually um, two variables with uh, four possible values total, right? And so you can draw that box diagram. And eventually we're going to try when we start digging down into the individual articles that Desmond writes to see if we can move from correlation to causation. Okay, I've got a bunch of other slides here, but I think this is enough to help you understand the next exercise. So I'm going to stop here.